in the land of Naphtali, and afterward did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan and Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them hath the light shined. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. They joy before thee according to the joy in harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For thou hast broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood, but this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. If you notice the difference between verse 5 and 6, we go from judgment and, and retribution, problems, difficulties, we go straight from that right into hope. All throughout the prophets of God, you see God saying, you're going to be punished. And God will punish His people, but with all the punishment that God levies on His people, God always holds out hope. Amen. Grace. That mercy, the grace of God, uh, listen, a child of God, rest assured, as the nation of Israel was punished for their sin, God will punish us when we sway, we stray from God. Right. But be sure, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Amen. 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 And rest assured that in the end, that God's still God and He still loves you. And He will punish you. He will correct you. And if you're thinking about quitting or thinking about turning your back on the Lord, you can go ahead and think about it. But I'm going to tell you, it's going to hurt you. Right. It's, the world is not your friend. The world is going to oppose you. But ultimately, God is going to correct you. That's right. I can testify that's not fun. The chastening of the Lord is not fun. Yeah. It's not enjoyable. You say, I just live for the world. I just forget about it. No, you, you won't. God won't let you. He won't give up on you. Amen. The Bible says, though, He gives hope in verse 6. For unto us... A child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. Lord, I don't want to preach long. Sometimes I do regardless of what I want to do. Lord, I want to preach the message, Father. The time's short. It's always short, it seems. But God, help us to bring the message this morning. I pray, God, please let somebody listen. Please let someone hear and let their life be changed by this. The world needs to hear this message this morning. There's so many confused people that, Lord, if we would just but sit down and listen to the counsel of God, yes. to our Christ, it would be all different. Lord, we just don't listen to you enough. And because of it, Father, we struggle so greatly. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want, to, I want you to notice that word. Would you please have a seat? Notice that word there that Christ, and it says that He shall be called wonderful. We spoke about that last week, meaning mystery. I have not seen nor ear heard. Listen, uh, you don't know what all God wants to do in your life, but I promise you God wants to do things that once... It comes to pass. All you can do is look back and say, wow, that was wonderful. That had to be God. That, I, couldn't have, I could never have schemed it that good. I could never have planned it that good. Nothing that I could have done could have made it so good. That had to be God. It was wonderful. I had no idea that God was going to do something so wonderful. And that's what God wants to do in our life. Mystery. Unknown. Things not yet come to pass. But if we just would learn to trust God and walk with Him and let God have His way, I promise you at the end of the day, you'll look at it and say, wow, that was wonderful. 
It was wonderful the mate God provided me. It was wonderful the life God provided me. What a wonderful job God gave me. What a wonderful way that God's allowed me to live. Listen, we need to learn to let God be wonderful in our lives. Amen. I promise you that would change your life. He shall be called wonderful. One day uh, we'll know him as wonderful. I Listen, uh, uh, the, the, the lady, the, the prince, the, the queen came to Solomon. I have not seen nor ear heard. She said, the half has not yet been told. She said, I came to see, but I couldn't imagine all that I saw. The half has not been told. And someday we go to heaven and uh, during the millennial reign of Christ and, and the new heaven and the new earth, I promise you, no matter how good you ever heard it would be, it'll not be nearly as good as what we find it to be. Not one one thousandth of a percent as wonderful as what it is could I ever present it to you today as a preacher. Heaven, eternity with God is going to be far more wonderful than what anybody will ever say. Truth of the matter is, as I think about it, I get anxious to go. Amen? But I'm glad that while I'm here... I get to call him wonderful also. And I can testify I've seen God do wonderful things in my life. But here this morning, I want to talk to you about something else. About counselor. Yeah. Oh, how we need to know him. And to be able to call him our counselor. Right. I, I believe that one of the great troubles of our world today and of our nation today is we've forgotten God as our counselor. Yeah. I believe there was a day, if you remember the story, the founding fathers were kneeling to pray. And there's different editions of the story, but one of them uh, said, uh, how, how could a, how could a, how, if, if a bird uh, cannot uh, 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 rise and fly, or how could a nation rise, and how could we do this unless we first go to God? We need to pray, man. And the, those founding fathers, as they were writing our founding documents, they stopped what they were doing, and they got on their knees and their face before God and they had a prayer meeting and they began to consult God to find out God what would you have us to do I remember the story of, uh, of George Washington and uh, the battle was not going well at the Valley Forge and, and it seemed like that they were not going to make it and one of the men was going home for leave and he had got up early in the morning and as he was leaving out, he saw General Washington in the woods in the early morning, the sun coming up he saw him pray. Yeah. And he went on home and he said to his wife, his wife was dismayed and she said, it doesn't seem good. It, it seems like we're not going to win. And he said, no. He said, I feel that we're going to have the victory. He said, I feel confident that God is going to work something out. That somehow, some way, we're going to have the victory. And she said, how? That's not what I'm hearing. How can you say that? And he simply said, I saw General Washington on his knees praying. I saw our leader in prayer, and I trust that God will provide a way. Listen, we don't have much of our leaders in prayer today. Sadly, I, I wish we did. Would to God that we did have men and, and that are in our office that would just stop and say, you know what, we can't do this without prayer. Right. We can't make this trade agreement. We can't lead this nation. We can't make these decisions. Our Supreme Court would be a lot more worthy of the name if all the, those members would stop what they're doing right now and humble themselves before God and say, we don't know what we need to know, but God knows He's all wise. Yeah, but right. the problem is not those men. The problem is even in our churches. Yeah. Many of our churches are changing today because the preachers and the leaders of the church are more concerned with getting some other man's book and trying to find out how to build a church and how to grow a Sunday school and how to do this and how to do that. And so few want to get to the Bible and find, find out what the Bible says. Our parents, our Christian homes are, are, are almost obsolete because parents today, we don't want to figure out from God. We don't want to ask God, God, how do I raise my toddler? So you need help raising toddlers? Yeah, if you ever had one, you'd know you need help raising toddlers. And there's a thousand and one psychiatrists that have written books. Some of them never even raised a toddler. Yeah. But there's a God in heaven that's written a book that teaches how to raise toddlers and how to teach them and how to train them. And, and then how to, i got to have a book how to raise my teenager. and i got to have a book how to make my marriage better. And there are some good books, but I'm just going to tell you what we desperately need. We desperately need uh, for some people to say, you know, I need the wisdom of God. I need the counsel of God. God, would you give me wisdom? God, give me counsel. God, direct me. You say, you mean Preacher, that you think God's interested in my life? 
Do I think he's interested in your life? I know he's interested in your life. You mean, preacher, you think God is concerned with my financial decisions? I know he's concerned with your financial decisions. You mean, preacher, you think that God has a will for my life and that if I talk to him and if I ask him and if I come before him and say, God, would you direct my steps? You mean to think you think that God would direct my every step? I know that God will direct every step if you'll let him. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by chance. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The steps, not the days, not the path, the steps of a good man. Every step is ordered by the Lord if we'll let the Lord direct our way. Old Bob Jones Sr., old preacher of the past, used to say, he said, I believe that God has a will for everything I do today. He said, I believe it's my job before my day begins to get on my face before God and say, God, what, what should I wear today? God, where should I go today? God, here's my schedule. Here's what people expect. But God, what do you want me to do? God, what would you have me to do? And we've got to get back to listening to God again. Amen. The counsel of the Lord, the verse says, standeth sure. It says, the Bible says in Psalm 16, verse number 7, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. You ever had God talk to you at night before? You ever had God speak? You know God will speak to you in the still of the night, in the silence of the time of night, God will talk to you. Romans eleven thirty three 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. Listen, for who hath known the mind of the Lord or hath been His counselor? Nobody counseled God. Amen. You say, who counseled God? God. You say, boy, that must be why uh, that everything that God did, He did right. Exactly. Everything God does, He does right. But God, God got news for you, young person, adult, old person. God will counsel you too. Yes. I saw Brother Jim looked around when I said old person. He's looking to see who I was talking to. Amen. <laughs> Listen, the counsel of the Lord. The Bible said in Proverbs 19, 21, there are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. That word device means options. There are many thoughts, many things that I could do. Look at me, guys. I wish you guys would listen this morning and hear this. I want to help you. There's, you, you you're going to have to get, the sooner you get this, the better off you're going to be. Is to say, God, what do you want me to do with my life? I mean, look, it's not that far until you're going to have to have one of these right here. And it's going to have money in it. And what's in it is going to be responsible for your wife smiling. And for the refrigerator being full of food. And what's in it and what comes out of it. And, and it's going to be responsible for, for what comes to the house. And what's in the cupboard and what's in the pantry. And sometimes you're going to look in there and there's not going to be enough in there. And you're going to say, God, what do you want me to do? And, and how are you going to do it? And, and, God, uh, uh, and, and God's going to direct you, uh, you know, in ways to help you to keep that thing filled up. And, and look, it's far better if you go ahead and start now. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, kids, it's far better if you go ahead and start now asking God how to deal with that stuff. Than to wait until there's an emergency what do I do now? Yeah. What do I do now? That's where the world is today. The world, that's where our country is today. Man, who even knows what the deficit is in America? God help us. We can't even begin to imagine the idea of what the deficit... You know what that is? That's the fact that America has spent our money unwisely. We've put money where we didn't have money. We've traded. We've done dumb things and, and made wrong deals. Why? Because we've forgotten God. That's why. And the further we get from God, the dumber our choices are going to be. Exactly. Amen. 
We desperately need to get back to God. And, and listen, I'm not just trying to preach a good message this morning. I'm begging you folks to hear me and to listen. And we, we need people today. It doesn't have to be a big group. A group this size of people that would just... And listen, God would be so honored and so glad if a group like this would just wake up tomorrow morning and say, God, I want to do your will today. God, how do you want me to order my life? Listen, I promise you, more than I could implore this morning, God in heaven is imploring. He's begging some people down here on this earth to let Him be God. And part of His being God in your life, a big part, is being your counselor. Jesus wants to direct you. God wants to direct your steps. But we're in such a hurry. I talked to people this week. We, we live and die by these things called phones. I mean, it, it orders. You, you remember there was a day when you used to not have a phone? Amen. You remember that? And you, and you remember, I remember when there was a day we didn't even have an answering machine. Yeah. I remember we got one so that the, when the boilermakers called, my dad could not answer the phone and hear what the message was so he could make a choice whether or not he wanted to go on the job or not. Because if he answered it and it was the dispatcher and he said no, then he had to, and then he went down on the list, you know. So he wanted to be able to act like he wasn't there, you know. And uh, so that's why we got an answering machine. But now we've got cell phones and we've got text messages and we've got Messenger on Facebook and you can't hide. They'll find you wherever you go, but the only thing is we've somehow managed to hide from God. And, and we're not getting the wisdom from God that we need. And we're not getting the counsel from God that we need. I'm going to tell you something. You desperately need, and I desperately need time away from all that noise to do what is called walking with God when we just hear from no one but God. When we agonize before God and say, God, what? Would you have me to do? I would dare say that every single day in the earthly ministry of Jesus, you would have found him early in the morning walking with God. And some evenings at the end of a long day of ministering to people, Jesus would say, we have record. He would say to his disciples, fellas, excuse me for a while. I have somewhere to go. Yeah. A board meeting? No. Yeah. A dinner? No. A show? On te- no, God, no, no. Jesus, you mind let me ask where you're going? Well, I'm going out to the garden. Out to the woods. What will you do out there? I'll meet with my father. And if Jesus needed time alone with God on this earth, then don't we? I mean, listen, how many of you know what's going to happen tomorrow? Anybody? How many of you think you know what's going to happen? You have some idea. Some of you do, right? You have some idea. How many of you ever seen your cha- plans change dramas- dramatically? They can change, can't they? But can I tell you something? God knows exactly what's going to happen tomorrow. Matter of fact, God knows every tomorrow of your life. Amen. Do you know this, that God knows the very last day you'll live on this earth he knows where you'll be when you die you don't know that and I don't know that I believe sometimes God gives us hints I've had people say yeah you know I won't be around very long and I looked at him and said yeah you will you're in good health and a year later I was preaching their funeral sometimes a month later I think God lets you know there are people that walk with God that I believe God lets them know hey you don't have long to live. You're right, preacher. Whatever you're going to do in this life, you need to do it now. You know, none of us, none of us have a guarantee of a long life. No. I think about my family. I want my family to, to know that they need to be in tune with God. My children, they can't just trust me to make their decisions for them. They need to know the God that I trust to help me make my decisions for them. Mm-hmm. So someday I won't be there. To make decisions for them. They need to know God. And you need to know God. 
And America needs to get back to knowing God again. And we need, and, and the Bible says God is not in all their thoughts. You say, should God be in all of our thoughts? I say, yes. I say God should be in our thoughts from when we wake up in the morning until we go to bed at night. I say we would be so much happier. We would make such better decisions. We would be in such a better shape. And, and we wouldn't be so confounded. And we wouldn't be so naked and bare before the enemy. Our nation would be so much better off if God were in all of our thoughts. And we would let God direct our steps again. Hey. We're not there. Right. But you and I can be there. Amen. You can be there. Whenever I was just a young boy, probably 16 years old, I didn't have a great prayer life. And, and, and probably you didn't have a great prayer life either when you were 16. But I did pray. You know what I prayed? I prayed this prayer. I prayed, God, help me to do your will. God, help me to do your will. Several times a day I would say, God, I don't know your will for my life. I have no idea what your will for my life is. But God, I trust that you know what your will for my life is. God, if you'll show me what your will is, I'll do it. God, help me to do your will. God, I, I heard preachers say that you ought to yield your life to God. And I, I said, I would try to do that. I would say, God, I yield my life to you. God, direct my life. And there were things that I would do that God would say, I don't, I don't approve of that. And, I don't want you to do that. And I would say, God, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Can I tell you something that God will correct you and God will lead you? Yes, How many of you drove here this morning? Raise your hand if you drove here. How many, drove here? How many of you, when you were driving, you had a steering wheel? You know, you, you know, when you're a little kid, you get in a car and you think, you, you, know, you think that's how you drive. How many of you ever did that? You remember? I remember. Man, you get behind the street, you just twist. You ever try that when you're actually driving? You, you'll get pulled over and you'll get a thing called DUI. And, uh, and you don't drive like that. Amen? Right. Today they have power steering. I was watching Brother Jim tell you he's got his power steering pump sitting beside his car right there. And so watch him when he's driving that truck and out of there. He's trying to turn it. It's hard to steer without power steering. How many of you remember driving without power steering? But listen, you, it, some, some of those old cars, they'd walk a little more than others. We had an old 77 Ford, and that thing walks some. You know, it, I mean, it's all over the road, so you've got to steer more. But some of these cars today, you can just put a finger up there. Yeah. But you try to drive on without a steering wheel. That's, don't ask me to ride with you. But you know a lot of folks say we don't even have a steering wheel. It's a world today, the population of our world today that, that's getting high on dope and, and living after the flesh and living after that. They don't have a steering wheel. They just shoot up and, and whatever goes in their vein and they, they don't have any moral compass and mentality and reality and they're just floating through life a complete wreck and so many young people have made the choice to let dope be their guide and dope is no guide. Right. And our country is going over the hill because of it. And it's sad. It's heart morally heartbreaking. But do you have a compass? Do you have a guide this morning? Do you have a counselor? It doesn't. I never ask anybody to let me be their counselor. I don't mind to help somebody if they have advice. I don't have a counseling line. I don't. If you want to talk to me, just call me up or send me a message, and we'll talk about whatever it is on your mind. We'll counsel about it. All I'm going to do is tell you what the Bible says. You say, I don't want to hear that. Well, then don't ask me. Because that's what I get my advice from. I mean, I'm glad to be a help to anybody. But there are, there are people around here that I might, you might ask me a question. I might think, you know, so-and-so, boy, they, they could help you better than I could in that. Do you mind if we talk to them? I don't have any bit of hesitation to that. Young people, I beg you. Let someone help counsel you. But more than that, let God be your counselor. Amen. Walk with Him and talk with Him. And let Him tell you that He's your own. Listen, Proverbs 19, 21, there are many devices. Please listen, there are many devices in the man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Jeremiah 23, 18 says, For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord? And hath perceived and heard his word. And hath marked his word. 
and heard it. I love that verse. Amen. See, what do you think that means to mark his word? Well, I think it means to mark his word. I think it means you read the Bible, and when, as you're reading the Bible, God speaks to you, and you mark the Word. You take note of what the Bible says, meditate in it, and let God bring it to mind to help direct your steps. There'll come a time when there's no one around but you and what Bible you remember reading and studying. And the Holy Spirit will use the Bible to help you direct your steps. Amen. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. word. Thy word is a light unto my and a lamp unto my thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Let me get it right. I got dyslexic on you there for a minute. You know that verse you said that's redundant. That's not redundant. A lamp is for when you're standing still. Everybody knows that, don't they, Brother Chris? We're, we're country. We know that. A lamp is for when you're standing still. And a light is for when you're moving. Right. Amen? And, and the Bible is a lamp and a light. Mm -hmm. It's a lamp to lighten where you are. And it's a light to lead you where you're going. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. We just, we've complicated it. There's a story in the Bible about a man named Ahithophel. Listen, I got to tell you about, I got about uh, three hours of preaching I got to put in the next 20 minutes or so. Listen, there's a Bible in this Bible, a story of a man named Ahithophel. Ahithophel is a counselor, and he's counseling for a man named Absalom. And Absalom is a, the son of David, and, and uh, Absalom has rebelled against David, and he, he wants to kill David. And Ahithophel is the wisest man in the, in the whole kingdom. But he's angry at David because I, I believe if you'll check the story, Ahithophel was Bathsheba's uncle maybe, and, or, 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 she, or a grand, grandfather. And Ahithophel was akin to Bathsheba. And so Bath, David uh, had, had sinned with Bathsheba. And this man Ahithophel was not too happy with David. And so he readily sided with Absalom when Absalom rebelled against David. And, and, uh, and he he was on the team of David's son, who was David's enemy. And David didn't have a chance with Ahithophel giving counsel. But David prayed a prayer. He said, God, would you turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness? And God did that. And you can read that story, and I don't have time to read it to you, but you can read that in, in 2 Samuel 15, verse 31. You can read that story. There's a story in the Bible about a man named Rehoboam. You ever heard Rehoboam? Yeah. He was the son of Solomon. Right. When Solomon died, Rehoboam uh, wanted to know how to lead the kingdom. So here's what he did. He went to the, to the old men. And then he went to the young men. And he said to the old men, tell me what I should do. And the old man gave him good counsel. And the young man gave him some bad counsel. And Rehoboam thought about it. And he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to do what those, old, those young men did. And whenever he did, you know what happened? The kingdom split. And there became a northern and a southern kingdom. And guess what? Israel still split. And it will not be made right until the counselor exactly. comes. Amen. 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 Right. It's still split. Why? Because of bad Counsel. Can I tell you something? Listen, the Bible said in Psalm 16, verse number 7, if you want to turn to it, you can. It said, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also shall instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me. Because He is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad. And my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. That word set is the key word. Boy, I would the, tonight, this morning, that I had time... You've got to mark beside, you've got to take your Bible, turn to Psalm 53 if you would. Turn to Psalm 53. I, I'm giving you some homework today. 
not because I'm in a hurry, but I want you to read the story. I'm going to explain to you and then let you read the story. Turn to Psalm 53. I'm just going to give you a Psalm 54, I'm sorry. Psalm 54, listen. Save me, O God, by thy name, and judge me by thy strength. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers are risen up against me, and oppressors seek after my soul. You see the colon there? Someone say the, or in unison, let's read the next part of that sentence they have not set God before them Selah that word Selah means pause yeah. because that's the key right there that right there is the key now let me give you the story and you can read this yourself in 2 Samuel or 1 Samuel 23 you can read this story I beg you to read it later but in 1 Samuel 23, one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible takes place. And it's a story involving David. And he's a brand new leader. He's got a band of men that really are just castaways. And so he has this band of men and he hears that a, that a, a part of Israel has been taken captive by the neighboring enemies. And he says to God, he said, God, should I go and should I help? And David doesn't know. In his heart, he feels like he should go. But he's a, David is a wise man here. And he says, God, I don't know what to do unless you tell me. So his Abiathar, I believe, his priest, his, his friend, brings to him the breastplate of the high priest. And it has on it the Urim and the Thummim. And the priest would use that. And honestly, it was like a green light and a red light. And if one light lit up, it meant don't go. And if the other light can't lit up, it meant go. And God communicated through the priest to the people with the Urim and the Thummim on the, on, the, on the breastplate of the priest. And so when he came, David said, yes, that's exactly what I need. I need to know what to do here. And so he said, let's go pray. And David and Abiathar, I believe it was, went and they prayed and they got along with God. And God said, yes, David, go. You go up and fight. And David said, okay. And he went back to the men. And they said, are you sure God said go? And uh, they said, we're afraid. Nothing wrong with being afraid. Amen? Amen. Fear is a good thing if you let it motivate you to do the right thing. Yeah. Hesitation to do wrong or to make the wrong choice is a good thing if you'll stop and go talk to God about it. So many choices and so many bad decisions could be spared if we would let God, when, when, when that flag comes up and God says, wait a minute here, then wait a minute. And consult with God and see what his wisdom is. Amen. So David went back again. He went back and told the man. He said, God definitely said go. You can read the story. He may have checked a third time. I can't remember. Maybe even a third time. Finally, the people said, okay, David, if God said go, then we'll go. Well, then another thing happened. It's the city of Keilah, Keilah that's under siege. And David rescues the people, sets them free. At the same time, David has an enemy named Saul. Saul is trying to kill David. So somebody says, hey, Saul, we know where David's at. He's in the strongholds of En Gedi by Keilah. He's hiding there. And word gets to David that he's been ratted out. And you know what David did? He got afraid again. You know what he did when he got afraid? He went and talked to God. Well, I tell you what, there's a, there's a reason for David's success. Do you think David consulted with God when he had Bathsheba called over to his house that day? No. That was his own counsel. That was his own wisdom. That was a mistake on his part. I'll tell you why. He didn't ask God about it. But so in this case, though, David is doing right. And David said to God, he said, God, he said, if, if I go up there and he said, I save these people, he said, are they going to rattle me out? And God said, yep. Wow. What am I going to do about it? And God said, I'll take care of you. 
So David is in the strongholds of En Gedi, and Saul is, he thinks that God has delivered his enemy to him because Saul is messed up. He's operating with his own mind. And in his mind, he thinks that God's on his side. And so David is all the way at the very top. It's over. It's over. There's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to go. He's on one side of the mountain, just around the bend. Saul and his army is coming and David's dead. There's nowhere to go. David's praying. God, you, you told me you would take care of me and this is it. At the last moment, the cavalry comes. You know, in the movies, the cavalry is always late. Yeah. But God's cavalry is always right on time. Yeah. Follow. I want you to see something. We're a discouraged people today. Christians are nervous. We're afraid. We don't know what we're going to do. That psalm said the zeal of the Lord will perform it. God's still God. He's still in control. If you and I are sweating, it's mostly because we're sweating life without God's wisdom. Because God knows what He's going to do. And God can take care of you. And God can provide. And God loves you. And God cares. And God will see you all the way from the beginning to the end. And David's in a mess. And he's saying, God, what are you going to do? At the very last moment, a messenger comes from the city. Saul, Saul, stop what you're doing. Home is under siege. Head back, Saul. And Saul turns his men and his army and he leaves David alone and he goes back. And David's up there and he's thinking, wow, that was too close. And then the tears in his eyes and he said, God, I was doubting you. God, I, did, I thought it was all over. I shouldn't have doubted you, God. You're true to your word. The counsel of the Lord stand as sure. Psalm 16, David said, I have set the Lord. And by the way, that's what Jesus said also. Psalm 16 is a prophetic psalm. That's what Jesus said. That's what David said. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night season. He said, uh, he said uh, I have set the Lord always before me. Look at that. I have set the Lord always before me. S-E-T. I have set the Lord. Psalm 54 says, For strangers are risen up against me, and oppressors seek after my soul. They have not set God before them. You see, listen, if you get this, I promise you, the anxiety, the nervousness, the Concern, You say, preacher, what are we going to do about the Illuminati? Well, they may have been around for a long time. What about the New World Order? I mean, you listen to all these people, and I've known about them, and I know about it. Man, I remember a fellow one time, every time a helicopter would fly over, he'd dive in the trunk of his car, hide underneath somewhere. I mean, what are we going to do? The United Nations, I'm worried about it. Hey, I believe every one of those enemies are real. I believe, I believe the liberals hate the work of God. I believe there's groups in America that want to shut down the churches. I believe they'd like to do away with every King James Bible believing, yeah. Bible preaching preacher. I believe they like to wreck and ruin the lives of young people. I have no doubt in my mind that there's a conspiracy against God's people and the devil and the hordes of hell would love to destroy your life and shut down churches like this and silence the soul winners. Yeah. Right. But they have not set God before them. Amen. When you leave out the key factor and God being the key factor, when you figure the equation and all these brilliant minds and these atheistic minds and, and these liberal uh, 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 trained philosoph philosophical minds, uh, when they sit down at the table and they figure in all their insanity and how they're going to get rid of us Christians and shut us down and silence this thing and take over, they forget one thing. Mm. By their very being of atheist, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So they sat at the table and they figured that the, the round table, I, I pictured this in my mind. God gave me this a long time ago and I, I see them there and they've got it all figured out. And finally, somebody says, yes. 
This plan will work. The last plan didn't work. We have no idea why the last plan didn't work. I mean, we've been trying for 6,000 years to put the silence God and get Sam God out. And, but this plan will work. And then a few weeks later, it's all right, fellas, back to the drawing board. I mean, I don't understand it. It was the perfect plan. I mean, it was a foolproof plan. I mean, we, we, we covered everything. What did we miss? They have not set God. For the, when you factor God out of the equation, you're in a mess. Amen. Now here's the message. What about us? Amen. Have we set God before us? Can I ask you a question that you set in before you this morning? Amen. Will, you, will you set him before you tomorrow? Amen. Will you spare time, Selah? Will you pause in the midst of your pursuit of life or your anxiety or your fear? Yeah. Your trepidation? Those are good things. You know, anxiety is not an enemy. It's a good thing. Little minnows today, little fish are being eaten by big fish in the rivers. You know why? They used to hide under the eddies and the rocks on the bank and the big fish had to come and get them. Now they swim right out in the middle to get eaten. You know why? Because all the antidepressant, anti-anxiety drugs are being flushed into the, down the toilets and into the ponds. And those poor little fish... <laughs> Are slurping that up and they think, well, I feel so good. There, this is the truth. I know this sounds silly. There's no fear. Well, why should I stand right here? I'm going to look at a whole big river out there. And they get eaten alive by a big old catfish. And the catfish says, thank God for antidepressants. Life has never been so good. That's why it's so hard to catch fish these days, Otto. I mean, the little fish have no anxiety, no fear. <coughs> Yeah. Listen, you know what? I'm glad for my fear. Now the Bible says fear not. But when, I, when I'm afraid, when I'm fear, I'm trepidatious. I'm, I'm scared. But I don't let that keep me from living for God. Because I learned a long time ago, I need to set God before me. And if in all your planning and all your living and all your scheduling, if you don't take time to set God before you, you're going to fail miserably. You're not going to make it. So how do you do it? You have to set God before you. That's my message this morning. He is King of kings and Lord of lords. I could give you a lot of other verses Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. You know what that means, Brother Mullins? That means that God wants me to do this right here. You know what I'm thinking about doing, God? Excuse me, I don't need to <laughs> blaspheme, but I, this is my thought. This is what I'm thinking about doing. It's, I just wanted to run it by you to see what you thought about it. See if you thought it was a good idea or not. What do you think? And then I, then I get quiet. Mm -hmm. And I hear what he has to say. Acknowledge him. Right. Children, how many of you have a parent? How many of you have asked them advice about something this week? Stand up. Oh. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And I, from the depths of my heart, Amen. I applaud that. Yes, sir. My dad's been going 12 years. I, I can't ask him anything. My mom's still there. I could ask her, but I know a lot more than her. <laughs> I, I don't have to ask her. She'll tell me what's on her mind. You know what's wrong with our country today? We ask our peers advice. Let me get on Facebook and see what they had to say. They don't know anything on Facebook. Well, I know Pinterest. They'll know. They don't know anything on Pinterest. 
Well, we'll have a group chat about it. They, you're not going to figure it out there either. How about you just hang that stuff and call dad or mom up and say, hey, I, I need some advice. Yeah, they'd be there before you. I need some wisdom. Yeah, amen. You help me. I mean, I talk to parents. I just wish my kids would listen. I've been there. I know where they're at. I could help them. So many verses. Listen to this. 2 Corinthians 2.16 says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that, we may inst- that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. It's, and you me explain that to you? It's like, a, it's like a spare tire you have in the trunk of your car. You have the mind of Christ. And every time you have a decision to make, you have the option to go out and get the mind of Christ and say, mind of Christ, help me make this decision. Or else you have your own mind. And how many times we leave the mind of Christ in the trunk of the car? Like a spare tire. tire And say, I don't need it today. I'm not broke down today. I'll save the mind of Christ for when I'm broke down. Don't do that. Is he who will be called counselor, mighty God, wonderful? Is he your counselor today? Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree. Planted by the rivers of water, that whatsoever his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. But the ungodly are not so, but like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the way of the ungodly shall perish. Psalm 33.10 says, The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of his people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. Did you hear that? The thoughts of his heart to all generations. The next verse says, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You know why some young people do better than others? Because they seek godly counsel. When they have a problem, they find a parent or an older person or someone with wisdom and say, Hey, I just got a little issue here. What do you think about this? My heart longs to get this message across. I've considered making a lot of bad choices, a lot of bad decisions, and I'm glad God has been there to give me counsel to direct my way. I learned out a long time ago, my name, Travis, means at the crossroads. I feel like I've been there a lot of times. There's a lot of times I could go left or I could go right, but the Marlins, I didn't know which way to go. But I learned I better ask God because God knows which way to go. And I'm glad for every person God's ever put in my life to help direct me which way to go. But I also know there have been many in my life that would have me go the wrong way. One day I read my Bible and God showed me this verse. They have not set God before them. I don't want to be like my dumb enemies. I don't want to be like the dumb atheists. It said in their heart, there's no God. I don't want the day to come where I live like one of those atheists. I want God to direct my steps. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I have to close the message tonight, this morning. Lord, I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we would learn to call you counselor. You are mighty God. We'll look at that later if it be your will. You're wonderful. But Lord, you're counselor. And yet, Father, so much of your counsel. It's not a matter of going unheeded. It just goes unheard, ignored, untapped. 
God help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand this morning? You need to come. You come. The altar is open. I promise you this. The Bible says about the Pharisees that they rejected the counsel of the Lord. And because they did, they went to hell. They full well rejected the counsel of Jesus and they died and they went to hell.